All right, welcome to the next unit. Uh, this unit we're gonna be learning all about uh, work, energy, and power. And um, energy really is uh, the, the big fundamental uh, connecting idea in physics. It's, um, it's what really brings all of physics together. It sits at the heart of it. Um, you've probably learned about uh, energy before in other classes. In physics, we have a really specific definition of energy. We say that energy is the ability to do work. So really loosely, um, if you want to do anything, if you want to pick something up off the ground, if you want to launch a rocket into space, if you want to cook some food, if you want to do anything at all, you have to um, use energy. And, and that's going to be doing something called work. Um, work and energy are scalar values. And they're measured in something called joules. So there's two ways that we can um, kind of define uh, work. We can either think of work as being a change in energy. And so we could just say W, which is work, is equal to delta E. So anytime, anytime the energy of something is changing, that must be because work is being done on it. So you can imagine stomping on the gas or gently pressing on the gas pedal of a car to make it start moving. The car engine is doing work on the car. It's using energy. The car is gaining that energy and it's, it's moving along. Um, we can also think of uh, work as being the product of force and distance. So you'll see this formula written on your formula sheet where it says work is equal to force times distance. Okay, so we're just going to do a few examples because while it sounds like work is a really simple idea, there's actually a few uh, kind of confusing pieces to it that we're going to take a look at. So um, take a look at this first example. If I were to lift a 30 kilogram weight off the ground to a height of 1.5 meters, how much work have I done? So I'm lifting this object up in the air. I want it to go 1.5 meters up in the air. You can imagine that while I'm lifting it, there's kind of two forces at work. There'd be the force of gravity pulling down and then like this applied force upwards. And maybe if I lift it at a constant speed, those two could just be equal. Well, the work done in this case is gonna equal force times distance. But how much force did it take to lift this object off the ground? Well, I guess it, the force that it took to raise it up in the air would be equal to the force of gravity. So this would just be Fg. And then the distance that you raise it up in the air really is just the height that you traveled. So we think about how high up you lifted this object. Well, we know that force of gravity, we remember this from last unit, that force of gravity is m times g. And the funny thing happens here to this formula. I could write force of gravity as being m times g, and I could write the distance traveled as h. Now, mgh is something you probably would actually remember from last year when you learned about a type of energy called potential energy. And this is how it's all connected, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so it's a 30 kilogram object. Uh, g is 9.8 on Earth, and we're lifting at 1.5 meters. So this comes out to approximately 440 joules of work being done. And so in this special case where when you're lifting something against gravity, the work done in that case is changing the energy of the, of the object. And what kind of energy is it gaining? Well, it's gaining something called potential energy um, if you're lifting it straight up in the air. And so that in that case just equals mgh, where m is the mass, g is the acceleration due to gravity, and h is the height. Okay, so imagine um, this example here. I've got a, a pineapple for some reason, and I'm holding it above the floor for 15 seconds. Well, in this case, and uh, this is definitely what a pineapple looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna hold it above the floor 1.5 meters, or 1.2 meters in the air, and I'm gonna hold it there for uh, 15 seconds. How much work is done? Well, this is the first thing um, to recognize about work, is the question here is how much work is done on the pineapple? Which is saying, how much did the energy of the pineapple change by me holding it there? Um, if you, you could imagine that just by holding it in that place, it's not gaining or losing any potential energy. It's not gaining or losing any kinetic energy. It's not really 
doing anything and it's definitely not going anywhere. So it doesn't really seem like much work is getting done. If I look at this formula, work equals force times distance, do I have to use a force to hold it there? Absolutely. But is it really going anywhere? No. And so in this case, the distance is zero. And if the distance is zero, then the overall work being done is zero. So for mechanical work, you have to actually be going somewhere uh, in order to be doing work. So no distance means no work. All right, we're gonna look at a couple more uh, examples here. So um, a 10 kilogram pumpkin, sounds reasonable, has moved horizontally five meters at a constant velocity um, across a level floor using a force of three newtons. Okay, sounds good. So here's my pumpkin and I'm pushing it with a force of three newtons. So there's an applied force there. Uh, I guess it must be a force of gravity and uh, sliding on the floor. So I've got a normal force up that way and probably a little bit of friction. In fact, I can tell that it's moving at a constant velocity. So not only do I know that there's friction, but I know that the friction must be exactly equal to the applied force, otherwise it would be speeding up. And so now the question becomes, okay, so work is force times distance, but which force do we use? Um, we're pushing this pumpkin along the floor. It's definitely going somewhere, so it's traveling a certain distance. Um, we're definitely using energy. But if you notice, the, if I use the net force in this calculation, the net force in this case is gonna be zero because the applied force and the friction force are equal to each other. So if I use my net force in my calculation, I'm gonna get a work that ends up being zero, which doesn't really make any sense. So we are gonna use the applied force. So the applied force of three Newtons times a distance of 5.00 meters gives me 15.0 joules of work. And so whenever we're calculating Whenever we're calculating work being done, we're not going to use the net force. That might seem a little counterintuitive, but if you're pushing this object along the ground, you're definitely using energy to do that. You're transferring energy to this pumpkin system. It's just that um, uh, it's not accelerating, and so there's no net force. So use applied force, or we'll see in some other cases, um, there are some other forces you might use, but generally we're going to use applied force. We're not going to use net force for calculating work. All right, so now I've got a banana box. Yeah, this is all this is all making tons of sense. Okay, so I've got a 50 kilogram banana box and I'm pulling it along a level surface. So I'm pulling it along flat ground, but the rope that I use to pull it is pulling up at an angle like this. So I'm dragging the box along the ground and it makes a, a like a 35 degree angle here as I pull it along. So I guess there's my applied force that way. Now go ahead and fill in the rest of the free body diagram as best you can. We've got a gravity down this way. Um, I can't tell if there's friction or not, but um, well, I guess there probably would be. Banana boxes dragging on the ground probably have a bunch of friction in them, so I'm gonna draw in a friction force. And then you um, might wanna consider how big is your normal force gonna be? At first glance, you probably wanna make your normal force the same size as gravity, but in this case, actually, it would be just a little bit smaller. And I'm not going to tell you why, but I want you to think about it. Why in this case would the normal force be just a little bit smaller than gravity? Um, and there's something going on there. I'll let you figure that out. So the thing to recognize is that, yes, this applied force is pulling the box along the ground. But if I take this applied force um, over here separately and just break it down into components, I could think of this part being Fx and this part being Fy. When you break it down to components, what you'll recognize is Fy isn't really doing any work. It's lifting up on the box, but the box isn't moving up. Really, the only part of the applied force that's doing any work is this x component here. It's the component of the force that's in the same direction as the distance that we're traveling. And so this 35 degree angle um, is gonna allow me to calculate the amount of the force that's actually doing work. So when we say that work equals force times distance, in this case, I would only use Fx, not the total applied force, just the x force. You could um, do a little bit of uh, trigonometry. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but you could find that Fx 
is going to equal the applied force times the cosine of 35 degrees. And so you could just do that by trigonometry. And so this becomes the applied force times the cosine of 35 degrees times the distance. Um, and when you put that in your calculator and, and calculate it, you should get an answer of right around 811 joules. So <clears throat> um, the thing to note here is that we're only going to use the component of the force that is in the direction of displacement, which is to say um, the amount of the force that goes in the exact same direction um, as where you are going. All right, one last example here, one last tricky one. So we've got uh, a car traveling at 61 kilometers an hour, jams on the brakes, slides to a stop over 42 meters. How much work is done on the car by frictional forces? Um, well, there's a few ways to do this, but I'm gonna go through with um, the formula we've been using so far, which is work equals force times distance. And so if we imagine we've got a car here traveling along and then all of a sudden decides to jam on the brakes, we got a force of gravity there, we got a normal force that way, and we got a big friction force back this way, slowing everything down. Um, and we know that it travels a certain distance as it's kind of skids to a stop. It travels how far? 42 meters as it slides to a stop. Well, we could find the friction force if we had the acceleration, but to get the acceleration, we have to go back to our old friend's kinematics. So V, V naught, A, D, T. So the final velocity is zero meters per second. Uh, the initial velocity is 61 kilometers an hour. Uh, don't forget to divide that by 3.6. And when you do, you should find that it's right around 16.94 meters per second. We don't know the acceleration, but we do know it traveled a displacement of 42 meters as it was sliding to a stop. So using our kinematics formulas, V squared equals V naught squared plus 2AD, and solving for acceleration, V squared minus V naught squared divided by 2D, we should get an answer of negative 3.42 meters per second squared. So note that the acceleration is negative, and that makes sense because, well, it's, it's traveling forwards, but it's coming to a stop. I can then um, use my net force equation, F net in this case would equal the force of friction and that will equal MA. So I can use this to solve for my um, acceleration. So the car is 1385 uh, kilograms and I'm going to use this negative uh, 3.42 meters per second squared. Now when I use that negative sign I get negative 4737 newtons for my force. Now I just want to point out that this negative sign, often in the past, we've kind of ignored that when calculating our friction. Um, but it is important to just remember the direction of your friction. The friction is backwards. The car is going forwards. The friction is in the opposite direction to that. So if you come up here with a negative sign, that makes sense based on what we saw before. If you, um, just, if you didn't have a negative sign there, that's probably because you just found the amount of friction, but you, you need to recognize that it is still backwards. When we then go to calculate work equal to force uh, force times distance, the question is, well, what, what force should we use? I mentioned before that we should generally use applied force, but in this case, there isn't an applied force. Well, what force is doing the work on the car? What, what force is bringing this car to a stop? And that, in this case, is the force of friction. So subbing in my values, 4737 times a distance of 42 meters, uh, ends up being negative, it's right around 20,000, so 2.0 times 10 to the five joules. Now the thing I want to point out here is that this is, it is, it has to be, it's negative. And there's two reasons to think about that. The first way is to recognize, well, the force of friction in this case was negative. It was backwards. And so when I calculate the work done, it makes sense that the work is negative. The other way to keep, uh, keep this in mind is that remember that we said that um, right off the, the beginning that work is equal to a change in energy. Well, how is the car's energy changing? Uh, as you jam on the brakes and slow down to a stop, it is losing a whole bunch of kinetic energy. And so you could think of that as being a, a, a negative change in the overall energy of the car. So work can be negative, which is maybe a little bit surprising. Work can be negative if the force doing the work acts in the negative direction. 
All right, that's it for lesson one.